Park Risen Hopkins coming to you from South by Southwest 2011. I am on the Liquid Space bus. Uh, what was the name of the partner uh, that pr actually provided the bus? Because Turnstone. Turnstone, right? And we're sitting on a former uh, Michigan State football team bus, which has been converted into a workspace. And and very nicely done. I'll, I may give like a little tour here at the end of, a, of the bus because this is a, just a really, it's definitely the quietest place I've been all week long. So kudos on that um no no audio problems on this shoot i'm sure That's but but uh you guys don't actually uh, uh do the workspaces you guys are creating a marketplace uh of sorts for people to find places to work uh we just had an interesting conversation that uh, we all wish we had captured so let's try to talk a little bit about that uh first let's do the elevator pitch on the company what what is it how do you guys encapsulate into a few sentences what you guys do Sure. So Liquid Space is a mobile application that lets you use your phone, locate, book, and securely check into great spaces to work right now. Right. Which is something that uh, I think just about anybody can relate to, whether or not they're working for a big corporation or as an independent person, because we all are working remotely these days, either whether it be a, you know, on a trip business related trip, or if we're, you know, actually working from home or working from a co-working space. Uh, it always gets loud at my house around three o'clock when the kids come home. Uh, sometimes I need a place to go do that conference call. And so that's, that's part of the, the need you guys have, uh, looking to fill, but it's a big undertaking. So you're, you're focusing on certain areas and certain ways and categories of, of places that people, uh, can work, right? That's right. We've, uh, we've categorized sort of the real estate opportunities for those billion mobile workers, uh, in the planet, uh, into three categories, public, uh, priced and private. And public spaces are, are those familiar third places like the coffee shop or the library where we, we know we might be able to find Wi-Fi and a place to sit, possibly. Uh, the priced venues are places like co-work facilities and office business centers and hotels that have conference rooms and day offices that can be booked and paid for. And then the big, the big tail and really the largest uh, sort of bucket of space that's out there are private venues. Uh, they are the conference rooms and the offices that are sitting unutilized or underutilized in every company and every service provider on the planet. Mm. Uh, because what's happening as a backstory to that is that all of these dedicated assets, these conference rooms and offices, uh, they're being used less and less because we're becoming more mobile. And, and mobile might be simply down the hall to the conference room, leaving my office empty, or it might be away at South by Southwest for a week, or it might be a business trip, or just working at home on a given day. Right. So uh, the, uh, the story about how you came to the realization that you could create this opportunity and create this this marketplace is, was interesting to me. So why don't you guys talk about your personal history? Because you guys go back a ways. Yeah. You, you know each other from way back. That's right. That's right. We're, we've been software veterans for about the last 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the third startup that Mark and I have done together. Um, the prior one uh, was uh, in the Silicon Valley in the 1999-2000 heyday. Uh, and then this one actually is an outgrowth of an experience that Mark had um, about uh, two, three years ago, right? Yeah, about three years ago, I took an interlude from technology and got involved in commercial real estate, but trying to demonstrate a next generation of real estate where we were aiming at improving the utilization of space. And we did that by, in essence, giving users, employees or, or, or tenants, the ability to use uh, a large space, almost like a health club, mm -hmm. and to have a whole array of different types of environments that they could check into without having to make a long-term commitment to it. And we actually built a, a physical building, a LEED certified space that was sustainable and, and technically smart. Um, but we learned a couple of really important things at that time. The first was that our customers, who were predominantly technology and company employees and startups, they wanted not just one cool space to work, but they wanted, you know, a hundred spaces to work that matched all the places that they were physically going. The second thing we learned the hard way back in 2008, 2009, and it hasn't changed yet, is that there's a vast amount of available real estate out there. Mm -hmm. And the real opportunity we saw was not to build more cool buildings, even if they were green, but rather to find a way to tap into that unused capacity. I mean, the same way that you know Zipcar is finding ways to improve the utilization of cars, uh, or Airbnb is finding ways to you know, improve bedroom usage, uh, you know, we, we sought to create a software solution that could connect mobile workers to great spaces. Right, and, and there's, there's a, an interesting angle that one we're because it's an industry buzzword sustainability yeah. and we talk about with our enterprise coverage a lot and there's an interesting angle sustainability kind of green angle to that that you we were you were you're talking about earlier um and it's it's less about you know the, the hippie happy good for the environment type stuff which is nice if you're into that but it's also self-serving 
uh, in a way, yeah. uh, which is what really drives adoption of yeah. sustainability. So yeah, ex ex explore on that topic. Yes. Yeah. You wanna? Yeah. Sure. Uh, I mean, let's take that story that you talked about before. The fact that you live in Dallas, right, and your co-working place is about an hour across town. Right. And our objective is that you can be able to turn on your device, no matter where you are, and see not just that place across town, but go through and see 20 different locations all nearby where you are. And that happens because all these other buildings now can make them sp their spaces available. And it's not just paid locations, as Mark said. It's the private offices, the lawyers' offices, and so forth that become available. When that begins to happen, now you're not on the road driving for that hour. Now you've gone through your, your one less car. You've also gotten a lot more time back in your own life, and you got the chance to go ahead and get out of home with the noisy kids and actually have a sane conversation mm -hmm. with someone. Um, or whether it's a Skype call as you're driving down the, in the street and you need to go ahead and find a good place to go ahead and work, or it's the chance to go ahead and get some real work done. The idea of being able to do that right where you are and nearby, as opposed to having to go travel someplace, really goes to the essence of what we're talking about for sustainability. I know my coworkers are watching this right now laughing because they all know my kids' screams uh, by by tone and pitch, so that you go ahead and laugh it up. But this is gonna once we get Dallas propagation here, you're gonna have nothing to laugh about anymore. It'll so all be by choice, yes, both by necessity. Yes. If so. I can add a point on that, I mean, in the last five years or so, a lot has been uh, covered about how technology choices have moved to the edge of the organization. Mm. You know, the CIO or the CTO has sort of lost their authority in terms of dictating enterprise software. It's really coming in the form of applications on appliances. Right. What we're effectively doing is pushing the real estate choice to the edge of the organization. We're letting that employee, with their phone, choose how and where to best work, how to be most productive. And that decision, which, which is driven by the interest of the user, the individual, is generally going to make for a more productive employee and, 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 generally speaking, a more sustainable outcome, economically and environmentally. Right, right. And, and so, the uh, yeah, that, that's, that's an interesting point, is that it's going to be beyond it, we're, we're going to see i think with this sort of propagation we already see a little bit of a co-working i mean because there are some large organizations that encourage users that are encourage employees to go right. make use of uh co-working spaces uh on trips or in public uh, whenever they're on a you know, conference or what have you but uh uh when we see uh your marketplace and uh start to grow i think that that would be a a very very obvious side effect is, you know, allowing users to stay home, allowing employees to stay home, even if they're part of a larger organization. Nice vision of the future. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's a global vision. I right. mean, this is the kind of thing, this is not just happening here in the United States, it's happening all around the world. As a matter of fact, in many respects, the rest of the world is ahead of the United States in this case. Um, you know, they're, they're trying to go through and go the next step beyond just co-working and hoteling in these large corporations and in the smaller businesses, but really now begin to take advantage, like you said, of all that other real estate that's already built out there that may not be mm -hmm. owned by themselves. And that's something that we do and we enable. Well, I mean, it also creates a, a possible, I mean, maybe not profit center, but uh, uh, asset for organizations that do have uh, a major investment in real estate, uh, that they can they can take advantage of, of mind share of others folks that uh, come in and use their stuff as well as you know make a little bu couple bucks yeah it's true i mean most um for most major corporations most companies in general real estate is the second largest expense after people mm -hmm. and in the vast majority of the fortune 500 over the last three years they've been on a tear downsizing their real estate footprints because mm -hmm. real estate for a large company is a fixed inflexible asset so uh, look at what companies like HP and IBM and Cisco have done over the last decade. IBM now has 42% of their employees not working on IBM real estate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Accenture is looking to essentially eliminate their real estate footprint as the end goal, right? They may never get there. They'll always have buildings. But, but they've moved dramatically to essentially uh, office sharing categorically inside. How do they drive that real estate cost per employee down as far as possible? So um, there are massive amounts of corporate workers uh, coming at it from the other side of the co-working kind of world who are moving into a mobile sort of work dynamic and looking for places to work. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's something that we see. I mean, because for years I covered mostly startups, and that's all I saw. Uh, but uh, as I've been, as we've delved very deeply in the last couple of years into the enterprise coverage area, I mean, uh, the companies we cover, they're all big enterprises, you know, Fortune you know, three-digit companies, and uh, they're all everywhere. <laughs> you know, every week is even a different city, so. Yep. Well, and certainly you take a look at, it, like, startups, for example, right? You know, startups today can get started up for a lot less than they used to oh, when yeah. we did our last startup back in, in the 2000 time period because, among other things, you can virtualize your infrastructure. 
-hmm. But now we're giving you the ability to go ahead and virtualize that real estate commitment you had to make before. Yeah, too. You, you close the round. What's the first check you write? It's the lease on the building for five years in Milpitas or San Jose, right? right. That, and you've just taken, you know, umpteen hundred thousand dollars of your available capital and tied it up. And you're competing with Facebook for the space, too. Yeah. So right. Just like you yeah. are for those employees, yeah. right? So now let's yeah. go through and make it so that you don't have to go ahead and spend that money. Yep. Now you can begin to go and take advantage of all those offices, including the offices of your investors who have all those extra conference rooms. They'd love to go ahead and let you be able to use them from time right. to time. Right. So, I mean, yeah, that's been one of the secrets of SiliconANGLE success and one of the secrets of uh, a lot of the companies I've talked to that are scrappy and bootstrapped is distributed workforce, yeah. you know, across the country, across the planet. And, uh, you know, anything that aids that obviously is going to, you know, for, I mean, just continuing the trend of, of uh, uh, cheaper cheaper startup costs. Oh, why don't you elaborate on where our people are? <laughs> I was going to say we're a great example of that. Okay. Uh, you know, we're headquartered in Palo Alto. Um, I actually have my home in Minneapolis. Um, we have developers up in Anoka, Minnesota. We have another set of developers in Minsk and Belarus. Um, we have uh, software people or uh, marketing people up in San Francisco and in San Jose. And uh, my co-founder here lives there. Where? I spend half my time in the mountains of Idaho and half my time uh, in the Bay Area or on the road uh, finding new business. So uh, you know, we and and in liquid space. Everywhere. And what's our fixed real estate footprint? Uh, about three hundred dollars a month. Nice. For one individual office for our 12 person company. Nice. Uh, which is probably going away shortly. And uh, the rest of the time we're in co working facilities and office business centers and working from our attorney's offices and our investors' offices. Um, and it's, com and it's, it's working quite well. Eating your own dog food. Eating your own dog food. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit uh, more on the uh, on on your app product side. Talk about the uh, the third category because uh, public and private are very easy to understand. You explain those. So how does the visa passport relationship come come about? How does that get populated? And and what is that? Uh, because that's always the, the toughest thing, really, when you're starting a marketplace is building up, uh, you know, supply and demand. And, and in this case, you, you're you're trying to fill that out in the San Francisco area and branching out geographically from there. So what what does that look like? How is that graph built? Sure. Well, we're building a two-sided marketplace. So you have members and you have venues. The members carry passports, which is the liquid space application, which runs on their device today and runs on iPhones and iPads. Um, and the venues grant visas, which are like permission slips that allow you to go through and be able to use that space. It's building that kind of trusted sharing relationship that allows us to go ahead and not only open up the public places as other listing services do in the paid locations, but also really the mountain of real estate that exists um, that, that we call the private real estate. That kind of real estate where people want to go through and make it available to a select group of people. Um, a law office doesn't want to make it available to everybody who's just driving by, but is very keen to make it available to their clientele. Same with our investors and so forth. Um, they want to be able to control that usage. The visa mechanism, which defines not only the who can use it, but also the terms of that use, allows you to go through and enable that trusted sharing relationship in a very unique way. And it's fundamental to how our product works. Right. So in many cases, our new members will be learning about liquid space from some private venue owner, like their attorney, who says, hey, Mark, I'm turning you on to the liquid space passport, and I'm issuing you this private visa for our space so that you can more efficiently use our conference rooms. We'd love to have you take advantage of that asset. Right. So I, so I then load my liquid space passport for the first time, and I find my private visa for that particular attorney or investor. But then it's, well, what else can I do with this application? And, that, and then I begin to unlock and find the public venues, the price venues, the other alternatives. Right. So, I mean, you could, you know, almost like, uh, well, the go wall of four square type thing where, you know, it's a, a as a be side benefit for being our customer and checking in right here, you also get. And yeah. Well. And similar to one of the mechanisms that they've uh, sort of driven their growth with, with go wall or four square, anyone can create a spot or a place, mm -hmm. right? They can find, they can put some tag on the map mm -hmm. that, that they've checked into. Well, as Doug explained in the product, we're going far deeper into the experience than just the check-in. You know, we securely check you in, but also then connect you to the space. But we will be leveraging the same mechanism that the GoWallas and Foursquares have, which is to allow anybody, any member, any passport holder, to put a pin on the map. Mm. Right. So if you have a, a workspace which is, uh, you know, useful to you and you want to, you know, put that in into the passport, into the system, you can do so. Right. So, so we'll be leveraging the masses to sort of crowdsource the finding of great spaces to work. D democratize co-working. Right. So if you're a venue and you're interested in getting listed in our, our uh, liquid space, go through and send an email to venues at liquidspace.com, and we'll be looking for you.
I mean, I, I think this is a very Austin idea, or at least a very Texan idea, because I we debuted, <laughs> I, I debuted uh, uh, Conjunctured oh, yeah. on Mashable back when I was over there. Awesome. Uh, I've done a lot of coverage of, uh, since I moved to Dallas, of the Dallas co-working spaces, and they've been popping up like crazy. Yeah. Uh, and so, I mean, it's it's something that I identify with uh, the the, st the type of scene you see at South by Southwest, type of scene you see in, um, like, Texas tech journals and that sort of thing. So I think that it's going to be... Uh, it's something that always has legs. People are all interested in learning about, even from all walks of tech, all interested in learning about interesting and new ways to work. I mean, one of the most popular tech sites out there, Lifehacker, right? It's completely generic in terms of tech orientation, but a highly tech-oriented audience. So... Yeah, and what we're doing uh, actually here at South by Southwest right now is giving everybody a chance to have that kind of liquid space experience in a place where the demand for that kind of experience is probably one of the highest. Mm. I was just walking down the street looking at all these people waiting to get their latest iPad 2 sitting on the street, all of them typing away, trying to go ahead and get work done, where right around the corner and a couple other places around here are a number of liquid space venues that they'll now have the opportunity to go ahead and use. Right, I mean, Texas has always had this, we got too much space problem, right? I mean, we got we got more places with more buildings on it than meant probably any, many other state, and uh, most of it sits unoccupied because yep. We got we got more buildings than people, so uh, yeah, this is a good way to to take care of that. Yeah. So what we've done here in Austin is we've partnered with the Turnstone Division of Steelcase, which is the world's largest furniture company, and you know think of them as the Xerox Park or the HP Labs of of work. Okay. And they're studying how to make an environment more productive. Uh, so they were a natural partner for us because we're trying to make people more productive by mapping them to great spaces. Mm -hmm. So here in Austin, we've set up with the Turnstone Division four pop-up workspaces around town. So we're sitting in this bus right now, mm -hmm. but in addition, there's a wicked cool uh, workspace set up inside of an art gallery up on North Congress. There's a workspace set up inside of a bar restaurant over at the Cope Bar and Grill. And uh, we're opening up a workspace tomorrow over at the Hyatt Hotel right next to the social media tracks. So it's really about sort of handcrafting uh, an experience with Liquid Space and Turnstone that illustrates the way this is going to play when we take it to a town near you, you know, mm -hmm. in, the, in the not too distant future. Right. I mean, I think we could talk about all the different aspects. I mean, this is for something I'm obviously very interested in, and you guys are very passionate about. But uh, we got to cut it off at a certain point. For everyone, everyone tells me to shut up at certain points, so I should probably cut it off now. But I've really enjoyed hearing more about it. I want to follow you guys, cool. so uh, definitely keep me in the loop. Uh, real quickly before we tag out, uh, what platforms can they download the app on? I know we got iOS. Uh, what is it? Uh, iOS only right now, or you got Android? Uh, We're on iOS only right now, and more no. coming. Yep, more coming. More coming. Yeah. Any timetables yet? No, no timetables yet. Want to say? No, okay. no. That's Coming fine. soon. Coming soon. Okay, we'll go with that. Uh, I'll be checking it out. Uh, you should as well. Mark Risen Hopkins here with Liquid Space folks at uh, South by Southwest 2011. Stay tuned to SiliconAngle.com and SiliconAngle.tv for more coverage coming out of the conference.